Let us pray. Grant us, O Lord, the grace always to do and think what accords with your purpose, that we, who cannot exist without you, may be enabled to live according to your will through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. We say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is faithful, will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us admit who we are before God. Eternal God, our Judge and Redeemer, we confess that we have tried to hide from you, for we have done wrong. We have lived for ourselves and apart from you. We have turned from our neighbors and refused to bear the burdens of others. We have ignored the pain of the world and passed by the hungry, the poor, and the oppressed. In your great mercy, forgive our sins and free us from selfishness, that we may choose your will and obey your commandments through Jesus Christ, our Savior.
Friends, hear this good news. This saying is worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to God in Jesus Christ. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Since God has forgiven us, let us forgive one another. The peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Let us pray. Prepare our hearts, O Lord, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but yours, that hearing we may obey your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis. Hear what the Spirit says to the church. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now his brothers went to pasture the father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now. See if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. The man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. The man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into the pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brothers and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite 
Traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Holy Wisdom, Holy Word, thanks be to God. Sing to the Lord and remember the marvels he has done. Alleluia. Sing to the Lord and remember the marvels he has done. Alleluia. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing praises to him. And speak of all his marvelous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Search for the Lord and his strength. Continually seek his face. Remember the marvels he has done. His wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O offspring of Abraham, his servant. O children of Jacob, his chosen. Then he called for a famine in the land and destroyed the supply of bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They bruised his feet in fetters. His neck they put in an iron collar, until his prediction came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the peoples set him free. He set him as a master over his household, as a ruler over all his possessions, to instruct his princes according to his will, and to teach his elders wisdom. Sing to the Lord and remember the marvels he has done. Alleluia. A reading from Paul's letter to the Romans. Hear what the Spirit says to the church. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you on your lips and in your heart, that is, the word of faith that we proclaim. 
Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, No one who believes in him will be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The word of the Lord. reading from the Gospel of Matthew. Then Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was many furlong distant from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost! And they cried out for fear. But immediately he spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I, have no fear. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, bid me come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, O oh, man of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Many of you know that James and I are in northern Minnesota for the summer. I'm preaching today from the sanctuary of Trinity Lutheran Church in Cook, Minnesota. In normal summers, we attend worship here on Sundays 
and we've gotten to know some of the congregation, like First Pres Tallahassee and most churches with sensible, responsible leadership, they are not meeting in the sanctuary these days. I was chatting with one of the members the other day. We were both lamenting the inability to gather together on Sundays in the sanctuary. She invited me to turn into their virtual worship, and I said I appreciated that, but we are attending our home church's virtual worship, and one service on a Sunday is really enough. Our cabin is on a large lake, almost adjacent to the Boundary Waters. If you don't know, the Boundary Waters Canoe Wilderness Area was established jointly between the United States and Canada in 1978. It is the result of our two countries recognizing the need to preserve the natural world both for our enjoyment and for our survival. It spans three million acres. No motorized boats or vehicles of any kind are permitted in the designated area, no development, and no commercial exploitation. There is, however, a mining company from Chile that is seeking permits to operate sulfide ore mining within the fragile ecosystem. Prior to 2016, the company found very little support for its proposals within either the executive or legislative branches of our government. Since 2016, they have found a strong supporter with the current administration. Some years ago, NPR aired a story about an organization called Wilderness Adventures that takes people with physical disabilities to remote places where they can experience God's creation in ways that we might take for granted, but for them is often are often inaccessible. The story centered on a trip to the Boundary Waters in the middle of winter. The narrator was a paraplegic Native American from Minnesota. It had been his first trip to the Boundary Waters, although he was very familiar with Minnesota winters. Also among the group was a contingent from Australia. They were very fearful about venturing out over the frozen waters. The Native American narrator was very amused by this. He said, apparently where they come from, only their deities walk on water. The famous story about Jesus walking on water to reach the disciples' boat purposefully conjures up fearful images. The boat is being battered by the waves. And very few people in those days knew how to swim, including fishermen. They were fearful of the water and of the unknown creatures that might be below the surface. The early Christians who heard Matthew's account would have identified with the fear the disciples experienced in their battered boat on the rough seas. They were members of a church that was being figuratively battered at every level of society, from, angle, and from every angle, from the bow, the stern, starboard, and port. So the disciples are out there. It is three or four o'clock in the morning. They are cold and wet, not hungry, because remember, they've just had the all-you-can-eat fish sandwich dinner, thanks to Jesus, but they are scared to death. Yet Peter says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And the Lord says, come. And sure enough, Peter gets out of the boat and is walking on the water toward Jesus. But he takes his eyes off the Lord for just a second and he starts to sink. Then Jesus holds out his hand, pulls Peter up, and they both get into the boat safely. Because the boat, the boat that is a metaphor for the church, is being battered by uncontrollable forces from surrounding the surrounding environment. It is still 
a lifeboat. And while the church and the people in it may be in danger from time to time, may be, feel alone, the boat is the vessel that carries the disciples. And the church alone receives Christ, according to St. Augustine. So he admonishes Christians always, stay inside the boat and call upon God. Of course, these days we're not literally inside the boat. And even though average Sunday worship is actually up since we've been worshiping virtually, we would all much rather be physically together. But as we have noted many times over the last several months, we are still the church. We are still the vessel that carries the disciples of Christ. And we are still the church, which alone receives Christ in our midst. In today's gospel lesson, Matthew intends to assure those in the church that they are in a safe haven, always subject to attack from a worldly culture that is at odds with the kingdom of heaven culture, but always able to draw on the strength and grace of Jesus Christ under whose care the church remains even in the midst of the most serious storms. Stay in the church where you are directly connected to the lifeline of God in Jesus Christ. That would be a good place to stop this sermon, but there is more to it and we can't leave it at that. Sorry. Jesus sent his disciples out on their own straight into that stormy sea. And then he calls Peter to get out of that boat and walk with him. We don't get to isolate ourselves. We don't get to hunker down with Jesus safe inside his sturdy boat. Christ sends us out into the storm of life to share the good news of salvation and love with the world. We are tempted to be content, gathering for worship, to pray and to sing and to hear the word of God proclaimed in ways that profoundly stir our hearts and strengthen our faith. But our obligation to Christ is to get out of the boat and show the world what the kingdom of God looks like. Unlike the earthly kingdoms, it looks like a place where people are safe, where no one goes hungry, where God's creation is respected and cared for, not threatened. How do we as the church do that? Up here in Minnesota, many churches, this one in particular, I know for sure, are getting out of the boat to oppose mining in the boundary waters. They are met with hostility on the part of local people who mistakenly think they will reap some economic benefit if the mining is permitted. First Prez has established an affinity group that is exploring ways in which the church can get out of the boat to identify and dismantle institutional racism in this country. This is an activity on the part of the church that will draw scorn from many who refuse to acknowledge that racism is the equivalent of a cultural coronavirus. Another First Pres group goes out to distribute food to those who are food insecure due to the pandemic, often in locations that do not feel very safe. Even if you're not literally getting out these days because of the virus, just as we get in the boat virtually to worship, we can virtually get out of the boat to walk with Jesus. Have you noticed that in these days of COVID-19, the catchphrase, be safe, has replaced have a nice day? 
Well, Matthew's point is this, stay in the church and be safe. Reach out beyond the walls, cyber walls in our current circumstances and be safe. Walk with Jesus and let Jesus walk with you when you're in the boat and when you're out of the boat. He is always with you to the end of the age. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us profess the faith in which we are baptized. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning, First Presbyterian Church family. This past week, our book group met to discuss the book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, and we had a rich discussion, lots of people involved, and uh, it was a hard book for um, us to read and to think about our own ways in which we have participated in racist systems, um, but it was also a great discussion about awakening and enlightenment and how we might move forward. So thanks to everyone who participated in that. And I'm looking forward to September 2nd at 7 o'clock when we will discuss I'm Still Here, Black Dignity in a World Made for Whiteness by Austin Channing Brown. This is our next book group book, and if you haven't gotten a copy yet, you can check with Midtown Reader, our local bookstore, or you can contact me and I'll see if I still have a copy left for you. Another thing to mark your calendar for is Sunday, August 16th from 5 to 6 p.m. at First Presbyterian Church. The youth will be hosting our next drive-in food drive. And so start collecting those non-perishable items that will go to elder care services. They have been thankful for um, the level of uh, donations that we have been able to provide them in this time when uh, the need is great. So we look forward to seeing you there. The youth are also getting ready for um, a youth mission blitz, and that will be from August 16th through 20th, and this will be a week where we spend time doing hands-on as well as discussion-oriented activities to look at how service is sacrament and how we can better be the hands and feet of Jesus here in our community and in the world. So um, pray for us as we plan for that and as we get agencies to partner with us to provide these experiences for our young people. Lastly, just a reminder that if you would like to gather with some of your First Church family and just check in and see faces, please join us on Zoom for Coffee Chat at 1145 each Sunday morning. Thanks so much. Have a great week. Good morning. These are the prayer requests for the week of August 9th. This morning we offer prayers of healing for Priscilla Harrison, Tara Reynolds, Terry Green, Jan O'Neill, Charles Freeman, Skip West, Christy Hay, Peggy Mellinger, Dan Hughes, Rita, the mother of Ann Del Rossi, Deborah Kilty, and Sabrina Wright. Also for all of those who have been diagnosed with COVID-19. Let us also offer prayers of strength and mercy for Judy Arthur and her family, Judy's father, John Russell, 
died on Sunday. Monique Ellsworth and the staff and the volunteers of Second Harvest at the Big Bend, healthcare providers at our hospitals and urgent care centers, and our first responders. Also, let us pray for Patricia McCoy Delancey, Thaddeus Gillen, who is the nephew of Adonica Geiger, Sarah Lamar, Myrna McGowan, Wilton Kane, the father of Robin Stevenson, Laura Lewis, the daughter of Patsy Kicklighter, Wayne Friedemann, Esteban Contreras and his family, Pastor Azette Sama Hernandez, and the Presbyterian Church in Cuba. The churches of the Presbytery of Florida. Reverend Margaret Fox and her congregation. We also pray for those in military service, including Zach McGuff, jo Jonathan Babineau, the great nephew of Beth Pulliam, Brian Guiso, Ross Shielding, who is the nephew of Ed and Mary Cutta. Jesus calls us o'er the tumult to follow, to trust, to cast our burden on him, trusting in the Lord who calms the waves and bids us peace. Let us say our prayers for ourselves and for the world. O oh Lord, we live in troubled times. We need you to steer us in the right direction. Smoldering resentments flare into violence. Problems we thought were being solved resurface. Old hatreds appear in new faces. Do not turn away from us, O oh Lord. Do not leave us now when we need you more than ever. We pray for our nation. Save us from leaders who nurse resentment for the sake of votes. Show us the path to our true humanity. Remind us of the values which make us one nation. We pray for our own community, for its leaders, for those who serve as first responders, for teachers and school bus drivers, for aides and janitors, for doctors and nurses, and those who keep our medical facilities clean and safe. Help us to grow in respect for one another, rejoice in our diversity, and strengthen the ties that bind us together. We pray for your church, gathered here and all over the world. Make us salt and leaven, help us Resist the temptation to retreat. Open our ears to hear your voice and to follow where you call. We thank you, O Lord, for all your servants who have gone before us, and we pray for those who grieve. Make us thankful for what was good in the example of your saints, and keep before us the promise of glad reunion in the life to come. Hear our prayers, O Lord, and give ear to our longing. Spur us to match our prayers with action so that our lives may be a prayer and our prayer may shape our lives. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us make our gifts of thanksgiving.
Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of glorious power and wisdom, how can we number your countless gifts? Look upon our lives with favor, and by the gift of your grace, prosper the work of our hands, that all we do and all we say might give you glory until your kingdom comes and our work is done and we find our rest in you. To you, creator, redeemer, sustainer, be all glory now and forever. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with you now and forever. Amen. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia.